I'm honored to be able to conduct this interview with Webby, mm -hmm. affectionately known to you all. Webby, you're a new mother. Oh, yes, I am. Tell us about that. Oh, we're going to... Okay, we're starting at the more recent end. So, um, the missus and I now have a little baby, Canaray, two months old yesterday. So, a complete change of lifestyle. Um, thoroughly enjoying it. Thoroughly enjoying it at the moment. Um, never thought, if you had asked me three years ago, would I be a new mum sitting here? No. Um, but um, I'm absolutely delighted. And they've brought a special little rainbow baby into the world and um, very, very happy. Very uh, happy. How has this changed your overall outlook on things in life? Um, probably makes me think a little bit more about the future than I probably did before because um, now I've got someone little to um, think about. Um, hopefully I'll be around the next 10 or 20 years to have a, get her to have a good, get some good start in life. Um, and hopefully also she would get to meet our community when she's old enough as well. I don't suppose you brought any photos to share with us? Only on my phone, but oh, she screams okay. mostly when I take photos. Oh. <laughs> but um, yeah, she's a sweet little thing. I'll give you a photo. Okay, thank you. But let's start right at the very beginning. I, I like to ask this of all my chat guests. Tell us where you're from, a bit about your family, your background. Okay, so where I'm from. So I grew up in a country town on the Murray River called Swan Hill. Uh, it's about four hours from Melbourne. Um, my father took us from Melbourne to the country um, when I was six years old because he wanted myself and my brother to have a better lifestyle than what was available in the city. And I thank him for that. I think we had a really good balanced upbringing. Um, but once again, you're in the country, so you, it's pretty harsh there. So you have to learn to amuse yourself. And um, so most of the things we did, I don't know what city people do. We jumped off ropes into rivers and channels. We rode horses bareback. We, we were hungry. We'd go up to orchards and pick fruit and eat them. Um, it was a good free lifestyle, I think, growing up um, and very honest. What do you mean, honest? I think country people are very honest, okay. um, very black and white, um, a bit, bit like myself. Um, whereas I find city people often bite their tongue because they think, oh, I shouldn't say that, where country people will just spit it out a bit more often, what they think. You yeah. said it taught you to be tough. How it so? Um, because I think country life is tough. Mm -hmm. you know, I think we were all poor in the 60s and 70s. We just didn't know it. Um, so. You, you know, life, life was tough in the, in the country. There was a lot of poor people. Uh, most of the people on farms weren't very well off at all, um, okay. including ourselves. Um, my dad did night school so that he could do better and became a teacher. So part way through my childhood, dad became a teacher, which then gave us a better lifestyle, I think. So we had our first house at 15. Before that, we were in social housing. Okay. What kind of a teacher did he become? Uh, a metalwork teacher, so he worked at the local tech school, um, okay. teaching um, people welding and how to make things, and, um, and a lot of farmers too, did a lot of courses with him to learn how to make gates and weirs and things like that, so okay. yeah, metal worker, did it all his life. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Did you have any concept of homosexuality at this time? No. Zero. I didn't know what it was at all. That's incredible. Even going up to a teenage years. No idea. No Incredible. Idea. So, you know, I, even though I knew I was different, I didn't know what it was at all. So uh, it was never mentioned. You know, it was never publicly um, talked about. Um, most girls in the country are tomboys, not all of them. Okay. But I'd say a good 80% of girls were tomboys, and we, that's what we just thought we were. That's what we were called, was tomboys. And so we'd be out with the boys riding the horses, riding the push bikes, digging the holes, <laughs> doing whatever the, the boys were doing. You know, we were just in, in amongst it. There was no boys doing this and girls doing that. We all did things together. Um, and, um, and just the way we were brought up. So we just, we were never told we couldn't do something. Okay. Which is a good way of life. Yet you say you, you knew you were different. How did you know you were different? From, from what were you different? Oh, you have crushes on people of the same sex that you're probably at that age thinking I shouldn't have. You know, when all your friends are getting engaged and married and you're going, oh, that's not quite the one I'm after. Okay. So um, 
It took a little time, probably till I was about 17, till I realised that no, that's not for me. Yeah, that I didn't know anything about it, I didn't know where to look it up, I didn't know who to ring, you know, you, you want to talk to somebody about it, there's no one to talk to at all. Wow. Yeah. Wow. No. So not until I came to Sydney. So what brought you to Sydney? Oh, myself and two of my um, friends from home, Wendy and Connie, we thought um, 17 years of age, time to load the car, leave home, wave goodbye and trip around Australia. And um, so Sydney, I ended up, I didn't make it any further than here. Uh, Wendy made it as far as Perth, so I think she did really well. <laughs> yeah, it took her a few years, but she managed to get all the way around to there. Um, uh, Connie didn't last long at all. She missed the family home and the farm life, so she went back to work on the farm. But you know, I stayed here and I actually enjoyed it. Once I got to meet people, I actually enjoyed the lifestyle of the city. Surprising, since I came from the country. What did you find here when you arrived? Bright lights. Bright lights. King's Cross was the first thing I found. Okay. So. And what yeah. were your thoughts of a big city and lights and? Um, frightening to drive the car in. That's all I remember. It was everything was you know the, everything seemed so close to you. Um, mm -hmm. Not used to all the traffic, so that was very frightening. Uh, I think the number of people was overwhelming too. If you went somewhere, there was a lot of people. I think the first thing that I noticed, though, is that um, my mum said, oh, Sydney's a big place, you'll meet lots of people. Well, I think I stood at the bus stop for six months until someone actually said hello to me, oh even God. though I said hello to everyone every day. It, 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 city people don't do that, you know, whereas country people do. So it took me a while before I could make friends, but once you start making friends, I think then it was a lot easier because there's so many people here. But so. you were very young, you mentioned you were, what, 17, 17 maybe 18? Yeah, yeah. So what did you do for an income? What did you do for a life here? Um, oh yeah, that was interesting. Uh, first job I had in Sydney, I've always wanted to answer one of those ads that said you don't need any experience because I used to see them <laughs> in the papers. So Wendy and I both thought, oh, we'll go and do that. So we answered this ad that said you don't need any experience and we thought, oh, we'll just see what they get us to do. And it was selling encyclopedias. My so gosh. <laughs> that was their first three weeks in Sydney, was walking around suburbs. They used to just drop you in a suburb and you're young, you don't know where you are and they would drop you and come back eight hours later and pick you up. And it was like, wow. We did that for about three weeks. I sold one set of encyclopedias, so I sort of done that, crossed it off the bucket list and went, um, I'm not doing that anymore. And then uh, I applied for a, a real job and I ended up working for CSIRO for six months because I did well at maths and science at school. So um, as a science assistant, um, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Um, and then someone had said to me, you apply for a job in the government. And I went, oh, I'd never heard of that. And I applied for a job and months went past, you never hear a thing. And then all of a sudden you get a telegram telling you got an interview the next day or oh, something wow. like that. And uh, so then I ended up into um, the, working in a government job um, for a while in the federal government. Left, left that, um, I did the army for some time back in the early 80s. Um, and then joined um, the state government of New South Wales where I worked right up until my retirement a few years ago. Wow, yeah. very good. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Tell us about the, the general scene you found here in Sydney. At this point, were you exploring what was available to you in the gay community? I didn't know where to find the gay community and I just <coughs> suppose my friends that I were here with uh, in Sydney and friends that I knew here were mainly Navy boys that I'd gone to school with. Um, mm -hmm. So they were straight people, per se. <laughs> um, but like, we went to a lot of parties and things like that, but I didn't chase anything because I didn't know where to go. Uh, okay. what to do. But I was very, you know, overwhelmed anyway and just enjoying the city. Uh, and it wasn't until one day it was my turn to do the washing and we'd moved to Enmore. And I said, oh, there's a laundrette round the corner and we haven't got a washing machine yet, I'll go round and do the washing. So I went round there and the woman said, oh, I can do it for you for so much a bag. And I went, well, saves me being here all day. So I left the bag with her and walked two doors up and went to the Enmore Hotel. And so I walked in, the, which is now the Sly Fox, so I walked in the front door and there's a public bar, you know, maybe half a dozen men in there, and then the man said to me, oh, you can't be in here, you have to be in the ladies' lounge. And I went, oh, sorry, where would that be? Oh, back out the door and round through the back entrance. Mm -hmm. And so I walked in through the back entrance and lo and behold, if there wasn't like 30 dykes in there all playing pool and the Space <laughs> Invaders machines, and I've just walked in and gone, 
hello. <laughs> and they were my friends for the next 20 odd years and some of them are still my friends today. So how did, how did was, they welcome you? What? Uh, well, obviously I got challenged to a game of pool. That's the first thing that happened. But my dad was uh, the top billiards player for um, Victoria and, and uh -huh. um, snooker player there for some time. He actually represented the state. So I was good on the stick as well. Um, so I won. <laughs> so um, it wasn't long before they had me in some pool competition where we'd go and play some people at Roselle and I didn't even know where we were going. Someone just picked you up in the car and off you went sort of thing. Um, so I, yeah, I was in some pool competition, um, eight ball you call it I think. Um, and it just started from there and once, you, once you're in a group with a team I think you know, it, it just goes from there, it just builds. Well, you did say you were very sporty and that that greatly oh, benefited days, you in the in community. In the early days, yeah. What, how did that benefit you? Um, I think it, it learns, it teaches you um, a lot about teamwork and I think um, working with different kinds of people because I think growing up in the country, you, you're very independent. You do things on your own a lot. Um, if your friends aren't available, you still just do things. And um, what I sort of... Um, found is that when you joined a team it was you know even though you might have half a dozen people on a team it's really equivalent to 10 because everyone digs in and does their bit mm -hmm. um, so I'd, i've done 10 pin bowling with gay people i've done darts we did darts for many years one of the few games back then that you could drink and smoke at the same time by playing a sport brilliant <laughs> brilliant i lasted six years until the no smoking rule came in and then i went well it's ruined that now so uh. Um, did a bit of lawn bowls because you could still smoke and drink beer at the same time. That was good. Um, I've done um, softball, baseball, netball. Um, and I just, I just enjoyed the team environment and the people you meet because not only are you getting together when you do the actual sports, you actually then um, socially interact after the games. And, and we're all very competitive, most of us. <laughs> very competitive, so you're with like people. Okay. Uh, and yes, yeah, so I sort of hung around with the sporty people um, for quite a while. Um, never knew about the leather scene at all. At okay. all. In the early days. Mm. Well, that obviously opened up a number of opportunities mm. for you, and one of them was Dykes on Bikes. It was. Tell us about that. Well, Dykes on Bikes, it was interesting how I got into Dykes on Bikes because I was with the softball team at the time, and I was their treasurer. and. Um, Dykes on bike. We were all drinking in the same pub, which is the Leichhardt Hotel, all sponsored by the same establishment. Um, so we were all drinking together and socialising together. And then something happened, and Dykes on bikes ran out of money, uh. as things do. So um, I got called in and asked, oh, look, as an accountant and as another treasurer, could I have a look at the books? And I had a look at the books, and it was quite easy to say they were spending more money than they made, and it mm. was that was evident. Mm. Um, so next minute I know I got signed up to be the treasurer for the, the, or at some meeting they voted and next minute I know I'm signed in as treasurer for Dykes on Bikes. And that was on and off for the next 14 years. Um, and that was a different lot of people again and um, a very accepting lot of people because most people in Dykes on Bikes have scars and limps and all sorts of things and often they're riding bikes because they're financially unable to own a new car, that mm -hmm. type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so you just met a, a whole diverse group of people and I thoroughly enjoyed it. I well, tell us about what you, what you, events you did, places you went with Dykes on Bikes. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes people would see us coming, like we'd pull over at a McDonald's halfway down the coast on a day ride or a weekend away and you could hear all the mums and dads going, oh, it's Dykes on Bikes, it's Dykes on Bikes. And everyone would be quite terrified of us, really. And we liked it like that. I still do. <laughs> I'm quite happy. I walk down the street in my leathers and people cross the road and I go, yes! Um, but uh, with Dykes on Bikes, we had lots of weekends away. Um, not always um, with bike riders. We used to sometimes have 20 people that would just, we call them our guests. Friends, friends of friends, family, uh, all welcome to come away with us on our weekends away. And we just did silly things that people do. I mean, we just entered, amused, um, made sure we had games, we'd have dress ups. Um, I learned to cook breakfast for 60 people. Wow. I was, I was good at doing breakfast, um, as were some others, but yeah, you, you soon learn that you can actually manage 60 steaks on a big, two barbecues and, and all that sort of thing. Um, we did lots of weekends away. 
um, lots of um, parades, as in the Mardi Gras parade, we um, pink ribbon rides for cancer, uh, raising money for breast cancer research. Um, there was other rides that we used to do. Um, I think the most interesting rides we did were with the, what we call the regular bikers of, of Sydney. And there used to be an Anzac Day run where um, the Hells Angels used to run it. And we would join in just as another group. And um, they would put um, what we call fake number plates over everybody's number plate. So that, because we didn't stop. They, like, it, was, it didn't matter if it was a red light, they just put their bikes there and all the cars and trucks had to stop and we all just went through. Wow. So they gave us all these fake number plates on top of your number plates so that when all the cameras went off, no one got booked. That was the theory behind it. They couldn't identify anyone. Um, and they were very interesting because you'd have thousands, thousands yeah. of um, people on motorbikes and, uh, and, and trikes and things like that. But it was very evident too where the money was. It wasn't with us, you know, the boys. You see that the men had um, a lot more money, some beautiful bikes out there that none of us could ever afford. Mm. But we were all welcomed. So they, they were also very interesting events that we do with Dikes on Bikes. Internally, we um, used to have, the, we still do, the Bike and Tattoo Show once a year. And um, people win prizes for the best bike, the best tattoo, best scarification. Um, we also, and um, people here have been and have been judges, I can see in the audience here. Uh, Black and White Ball is a big annual event and was held recently um, and that's a big get together where everyone gets to dress up and listen to music and have a dance and um, not on bikes so <laughs> there's alcohol involved of course so no bikes that night generally. Um, but yeah, we, there's a lot of social activities involved, um, not just riding. Okay. But there's also education, you know, how to maintain your bike, how to fix a puncture if you're on the side of the road, that sort of thing. But you said you were the treasurer on again oh, yes. and off again for 14 years. Mm -hmm. So how were you able to manage it financially? You said it had been in having yeah. difficult. Yeah. Uh, well, the main thing was to mm -hmm. um, make sure you did fundraising, which was reinstigating, getting the bike and tattoo show back up so that people came. And it was just like gold coin donation, but all those things helped. Sell raffle tickets. Um, so you've got to have money to make money sort of thing. So made sure that we made, did the fundraising. The black and white ball was a great fundraiser for the year because everyone would get dressed up and come along and enjoy that. And that then allowed um, more money to be spent on the parade because we all like the bikes to look good as they're coming up the street. Um, and people forget, you know, it costs us a lot of money every year, hundreds of dollars to buy the special gels. People just think, oh, you just get put something over your headlight. No, it will burn. Then, you know, they're as bright as these lights here. So you actually have to use lighting gels for all the headlights, and very, that's quite expensive. But we worked out after many years that the um, kitchen tiles are exactly the right size, not for the Japanese bikes, but for most of most motorbikes. So we would sit on my kitchen floor and me measure up a, a line, measure up a line, and we'd cut out all these rolls of um, gel. And they're also in all the colours of the rainbow, uh -huh. the gay pride flag. Uh -huh. So you have to have all your gels. We have our rainbow flags. You've got to uh -huh. buy. There's all sorts of things, and so we have what we call these rocket packs, and you have to buy all this stuff and get it ready for the parade. So that having the fundraisers during the year enabled funding for better funding for the Mardi Gras parade. Uh, it meant that people didn't have to pay as much to go in the parade, so you could actually have more bikes because people could afford it better. Um, and then on, on weekends away, we used to try and get sponsorships and have like a raffle pack. So the people would buy $5 worth of tickets. Everyone who went away would buy $5 worth of tickets or so. And they might win T-shirts, tickets to a, the next event that's on, run, been run by someone, that sort of thing. So all that money went into the, the pool. Um, so when I left there, they still had a few thousand dollars in the bank, which was quite good. Why did you choose to leave? Oh, I'd done it for so long, I wanted to enjoy myself. So it, when I hit 40, I basically said, well, I think I've had enough on committees now. I'm going to retire from committees and I'm going to live the life and actually attend all these events and participate. But okay. that didn't happen. What did you do instead? Um, I got roped into being um, the public officer of Sydney Leather Pride Association uh -huh. within one year of leaving Dykes on Bikes. Um, and then from being the public officer, I think within a year I was acting president and then became president for two years because I think that's our limit on being president, was two years and I'm still public officer today. 
Okay. One of the, one of the representatives. Yeah. Before we go too far though, what was House of Butch? Uh, yeah, that was just our house. Um, we, <laughs> we had a few of us that, um, we had this thing that every time we moved in with our girlfriends and then we'd break up and then we'd <laughs> have to leave and we'd leave all the furniture behind and a few of my mates, we got together and we talked about it and we were sort of sick of doing this. We need a place of our own. So we invented what we called the House of Butch. So we hired this house and I think there was five bedrooms in it. It was a big three-storey place. And um, it was um, all dykes on bikes. Oh my gosh. All, I call myself soft butch, not hard butch, but you know, we're all butchers to some degree. And so we all decided we're all in this one house, so therefore this will never happen to us again. And that was our thing of it. So we had a house of butch where we were in Petersham and one suburb down in Stanmore. We had the girls in what we called the house of femme. So oh. there was all the, all the femmes living down the road. So the two houses spent a lot of time going between the two actually. <laughs> But it was actually quite a, quite a fun thing at the time. Everyone knew it. You just say, party's on House of Butch, Saturday week, and everyone would turn up. They knew where it was. <laughs> so, yeah, and that lasted quite a few years. I think we had a good five or seven years all together. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, yeah. How many people lived there at any one time? Um, well, it depends if people had partners or not. But well, with five bedrooms, you could have at least ten, couldn't you? <laughs> I don't know what the lease said. I don't think the lease said that many, but, you know, it didn't matter. Did you have any squabbles, any problems among people? Yeah, often, <laughs> often. Um, we, we had mainly around money, I mean, those sort of things happen, you know, people sort of, you know, decide to go out instead of paying their rent, you know, there might be money mm -hmm. issues, but once you get those um, little things sorted so that you have a little um, system in place, so once we got the little, the jar under the sink, I think ended up being the system, but it worked. But once we had a, a little system in place, um, no, we didn't really have any arguments because we used to go out together like a family. We'd, oh my gosh. Yeah, we'd have our once a month family trip out to Hellfire and all that sort of stuff and um, we thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah, no, it was good. We hung out with each other and we loved it. Yeah, it was a good time. So you said it went for around five to seven yeah. years, but what, yeah. what broke it up then in the end? Oh, well, because people do end up getting with people and moving out and breaking up and then eventually the uh, landlord said he wanted to sell the premises. So that was sort of the final push and we all went our own way. Yeah, but no, it was good over the years. But for such an unconventional um, gathering of people, how did the landlord see this when you approached try to rent this place? Well, I don't, I don't think we were dressed in our leathers when we went and viewed the house. I'm pretty sure of that. So I think we would have been in normal clothes. But all I remember is we'd been looking for a couple of weeks and we'd seen some really terrible places. And the, the guy opened the front door and we looked in and it had obviously just been freshly renovated, freshly painted, beautiful lights and everything was done. And we just walked in and said, we'll take it. We didn't even... Wow. We just walked in the door. We'll take it. It was like that. It was just so good. Um, and there was just enough room for everybody, which was lovely. And we had a lovely yard, double garage, um, which was usually full of motorbikes and the Corvette. Um, but um, yeah, no, it was a great, great location for us. We were on a corner so that we weren't interfering with neighbours or anything. Um, good party yard. Was it here in Sydney? It was here in Sydney. Okay. Yeah. okay. Did you go as a group? I, ca I can only imagine a group of however many, five to ten people, house hunting together did you do that well we'd have sort of three of us go at a time oh okay okay yeah 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 we, and then um a friend of ours pommy was she wasn't allowed to go house hunting anymore because the place she picked us out was pink and sorry, uh, what? pink oh, oh oh she picked out a pink house in dulwich hill for us and uh, when well. sue and i went and had a look we went ah it's pink no it's salmon no you're in denial it's pink we're not living here so <laughs> um yeah, yeah, we just, we knew we couldn't live in a pink house, that was about all. <laughs> what was the colour then of the one you chose? Oh, I think probably grey on the outside, if I remember. Okay. Yeah, very bland, but it suited us. Well, s switching the rail a little bit, tell us about your exposure to leather and kink. How did that evolve for you? Oh, well, yes, I have a funny story about that. So. Remembering that I was also in the, in the softball when we first were hanging yes. around with the Dykes on Bikes girls. So someone has a 40th birthday party or something like that and it's a leather night. So everyone's got to wear their leathers. And so, you know, I'm sort of having a panic attack going, oh my God, I'm going to have to wear my gardening gloves and my belt. I have nothing else because uh. I didn't own a piece of leather at that point in time. Um, and um, 
So it was a bit of, you know, and, and there was a lot of, well, not just me in the same boat, there was a lot of other people going to this party who hadn't worn leathers before. So people who had leathers put them out for us and said, you know, try them on, get dressed up. So we basically we were dressed up like little Barbie dolls. <laughs> and um, people put the right gear on us and off we went to this party. And it was like, oh, we didn't feel good. I think we look good. Comfortable. I'm going to have to get myself some of those. And... Um, wasn't soon soon after I've got my first pair of leathers because they're just best thing ever yeah, for me. Yeah. Was there anything um, shocking, enlightening um, d yes. that you didn't expect? Maybe. Yeah, I would say um, my first big eye-opening thing was um, a party called No Holes Barred up at Kings Cross there, and. Um, one of my friends was doing a show and said, oh, you, wait, you see this, Webby, you're not going to believe it. And I went, oh, OK. Anyway, it was basically a man's genitals were getting nailed to a lump of wood. And no, I hadn't seen that before. And so, at first of all, my eyes were sort of going like, oh, ouch. And then it was like, is that how small a man's penis is? <laughs> Where is it? And I, because I, I, yeah, being... The way I am, I really hadn't paid any attention. And then I, the first thought that came into my mind is, oh my God, my dildos are far too big. <laughs> <laughs> but then afterwards, someone did say to me, well, yours would dribble up too if it was also getting nailed to a lump of uh, wood. And then uh, I thought, uh, yeah, I think you're right there. But yeah, that was a big eye opener for me. That was an eye opener for me. I saw things I hadn't seen, but not into the way that I was offended or anything, but it was just like, it was an eye opener. Yeah. It was an eye opener. Yeah. And um, I think that was probably the first time I'd have been able to spend a decent amount of time watching someone do rope work. Okay. You know, where it wasn't sort of at a big party where, you know, people were dancing in front of you or in the road and you could actually watch and enjoy what was happening. And um, uh, I still get very fascinated by the rope work that people do. Yeah, I still still enjoy watching, watching that. Do you participate in that? No, I'd, I'd rather watch. Okay. Yeah, but I, I still enjoy watching it. Something that I've always enjoyed. So um, rope work, I, I thoroughly enjoy watching. And I was, you know, I wouldn't have, have you know, if I hadn't been to some of those events, I wouldn't have known that I liked watching it. But I do. But as you, as you saw some of these things and, and were exposed to new <coughs> concepts, new ideas, was there anything that immediately grabbed you and said, I have got to do this? Oh, tattoos. Okay. Yeah. I think I only had one tattoo before I joined Dykes on Bikes. You know, so, or the leather community. A lot of people in the leather community have beautiful tattoos. I don't have many. Um, I think if I was younger today, I'd probably have a sleeve here and a leg there or something like yeah. that. But that's not how we did it in those days. But I think, um, and I still enjoy looking at ink and I still enjoy um, um, getting a piece of ink, but it's been a while since I've had it. But I think that was something I probably would not have gone and done normally. Oh, okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. But it was so, like, it was very normal in this community. Mm -hmm. Tattoos are normal. Um, and I like the look of them. So it was a bit like, well, why can't I have some? you know, where I'd sort of been grown up. I don't get tattoos because then the police will know who you are and, you know, all that sort of stuff. So, you know, there's parents do in those days. Um, and then you realise, no, it's not only um, working girls that have tattoos, mm, which is, mm, you know, mm. basically what your parents tell you. Mm, um, mm, so um, I think that was a sort of a bit of a, oh, no, it's a relief. I can get one of those now, a couple of those, yeah. But... As far as, um, you, you still, I'm still happy to learn, you know, I don't know everything, so I, I think I still learn, you know, by various things that are on. Some of the shows that I've, I've witnessed in my life have been amazing, you know, and you sort of, you go, wow. Um, what would you like to learn if you could go out and work with someone and, and learn something? Um, probably to use a flogger better, I think, you know. I, mm -hmm. I don't think I'm too bad on it, but um, sometimes I, I'd like a better rhythm, I think, you know, nicer, okay. a nice better rhythm. But otherwise, no, I think I've, if I've wanted to learn something, I've usually found someone to show me how to, how to do it. Yeah. Is there anything you won't do or won't try? Oh, look, I'm not keen on needles. Okay. I don't know. I've been like that all my life. You know, so, yeah. I mean, I'll have them medically, but I don't particularly want people sticking needles in me. So I'm happy to watch someone else have needlework done on them, but no, it's not, that's not my thing. 
Okay. Personally, no. Anything else is pretty okay. But you, you told me when we prepared for this interview yeah. that working in the leather kink community t uh, taught you or you learned the value of volunteering. Oh, yes. Tell us about that. Yeah. Well, I come from a family of volunteers, but I will say mainly on the, the churchy side for most of my family, except for my dad, who was a bit the rebel. He was the black sheep. But even my father was a volunteer. You know, he, he would volunteer and do things on Anzac Day. He played the drums going up the street. Um, he was in the local band. He was a drummer, so he was in the band. He did the RSL every Saturday night for the old ducks and never got paid, you know, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and amongst other things, um, volunteering at elections and that sort of stuff. I think um, I'd, I'd done some volunteering myself, even with the sports, because I was on the, um, the ga games planning committee for softball when that was coming over for 2002. Um, but once you join the leather community, it is run by volunteers. Every yeah. event, even if it's a commercial event, there'll be volunteers on the door, there'll be volunteers in coat check, there'll be volunteers running around making sure things run smoothly. Um, all your dungeon monitors, for instance, in the leather yeah. community, everyone's yeah. volunteering. Um, so you learn of, I think, the size of the events too that can be put on by having so many volunteers. Um, you know, like a, a good Dikes on Bikes event would have been 400, 600 people. Wow. Um, a good Leather Pride event would be 5,000, 6,000 people. So, huge difference in size. And it's all run by volunteers, all of them. And, um, I, and there's still, the community is still run by volunteers. So, very big thing. So, I support as many volunteers as I can and try and volunteer for as much as I can. For example? Oh, well, for example, this year I was the guest judge at Insel BB over in San Jose, and um, that was volunteer, I paid for it myself, they don't give you anything. Um, I've um, done, talked on the radio um, when, you know, gay issues from time to time, just, oh, okay, I'll do it, volunteer. Um, I still do coat check with some of the people here at some of the events, um, which I thoroughly enjoy because at my age now, I can't be on the dance floor all night, my legs yeah. don't allow me to. Um, but it still allows me, by volunteering, it still allows me to socialise with my friends and participate. Yeah. So I think it's all about inclusion. Um, so, yeah, over the years we've all done our volunteer work, I think. Yeah. Hopefully. 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 Yeah, but something I encourage in young people. I think it instills um, good values in you if you become a volunteer. Yes, I Not agree. And less demanding. Let's come back over, you, you mentioned it a little bit earlier when we were speaking. Tell us about your work with the Sydney Leather Pride Organization and your presidency. What, what all did that entail? Oh, well, at the time, I didn't really know what the president of Sydney Leather Pride was supposed to do because the, that president at that time was Aaron and Aaron was overseas and then Aaron contacted me and said, can you act as president, please? I think there'd been a falling out amongst the boys or something. Mm. Uh, and I didn't really know what I was supposed to do. So basically I just said, oh, well, we'll hold a barbecue on one Sunday afternoon on the deck at the Oxford Hotel, um, the outside deck there, and we'll just see who turns up and see what they want. And I think that's basically how I started. So we had a few, you know, it was summer, so we had a few barbecues. People came, more people came. Um, what would you like? And a lot of people want like the idea of cocktail parties and something where they could wear their good leathers out. Um, so then we tried to run, you know, two or three cocktail parties a year. Um, and also back then, a tradition of Sydney Leather Pride was running the annual Inquisition party. Mm -hmm. So I was lucky to be able to put that on three times. Uh, the first one was more of a proper Inquisition uh, because it was held in the dome, which is a traditional place for it. Um, but the police basically ruined it, that's all I can say. Mm. Um, and so the next um, couple, of, we had to do party in a pub, which is really not the same for a leather um, night. Okay. Um, but we did our best at the time, but under this current government, I can't, until the you know, lockout laws get lifted or something changes, I don't think we'll be having any more. They were just so against our parties, it wasn't funny. Like, why? why can't you start them at six o'clock at night and finish at midnight, was sort of the comments we were getting. Um, they made us have half um, low, low alcohol beverages. We weren't allowed any full alcohol beverages. Our average age is 35 going to our events, not 18. Um, yet the police still, oh no, we don't want people getting drunk. And it was like, hello, we're all adults. So we were having 
the nanny state inflicted upon us, and it's still, we're still being inflicted at this point in time. Do you think it's outright discrimination what they're doing? Yes. Okay. Yes, it is. They've shut down this strip, they've shut down the King's Cross strip, um, and which is where most of the fringe people um, would gather. And so what they've done is scattered the fringe people. And I class us as fringe people. Yeah, so it's government doing it. When we met and we, we had drinks a couple of days ago, yes. you mentioned that with the World Pride coming here in a couple yes. of years, that these laws may be reevaluated to accommodate that. Do you think that it's strictly economical, or do you think that it's something that they are going to permanently enable? Uh, the government at the moment is actually talking about lifting the lockout law for this strip um, by Christmas. I can't wait to see it. Um, as, when it does happen, yes, we will be booking a venue for the next event because that's what we need. Um, because at the moment, last people in at 1.30 just um, doesn't work viably economically because then the bar shuts and then the venue is not o earning any revenue, so therefore, why have us there? I, and yeah. that's, I can understand that yeah. commercially. So the lockout laws need to be lifted. They have lifted them in the past for um, Mardi Gras, oh. on the night of Mardi Gras only. But they have lifted it on that night, so there is precedent already. But we would like it lifted permanently, obviously. Um, but I think uh, with the pressure, and there's a lot of support from Alex Greenwich and Clover Moore at the City of Sydney, I think that they will also push to ensure that when we have overseas visitors here, that we don't have lockout laws, we're, we're hoping. Because okay. that would be a disaster. Yeah. That yeah. would be a disaster. But do you feel that, that the, the community is empowered enough to, to force the political leaders to reevaluate this situation? Uh, or why has it been permitted to continue, in your opinion? Um, we don't know. We live in a bubble. And I think that's what we've realised after the last couple of elections, that we think that we've got numbers and we think that we're, everyone we talk to is in the same direction as us. And then um, we're the only people that wake up the next day going, what the hell happened? Um, yeah. Us and other groups, but um, yeah, we've been in a bubble for a couple of years, which is sad. I think the the rise of what I call the happy clappers, um, the relief, the Christian front, um, is pretty big. They've got lots of money. They've got lots of people. We don't have lots of money, um, and yeah, I think we are being discriminated against as a community. But do you feel that there could be empowerment in in it to be able to change this? Hmm. Um, yes, we need, we need to actually infiltrate the, politi the political cycle and actually have people in there, yeah. I believe. Yeah, because unless you know somebody in there, nothing happens and we don't um, know anyone in there, so yeah. I don't know how that would work, really. You know, it's not my, mm. I don't want to be a politician, but someone, you know, it would be nice if we did have someone going through our communities to um, become politicians so that they can manage from the inside because I think that's where you have to make the change and unfortunately we're not there yet. Yeah. Yeah, we're still a minority. But how have you seen the, the leather fetish scene evolve here in Sydney? Okay, well I suppose I joined it probably in the 90s and in the 90s it was full on, it was fabulous. Every event I went to was an eye-opener, it was well attended, it was, and there were no fights or anything. I mean, I don't know what, you know, these are sort of, there was no problems at any of these events. Um, well attended, everyone dressed nice, um, entertainment was amazing. I mean, I saw a guy at one of the Inquisition parties, he, like a blacksmith actually, they had a big cross and someone got nailed to a cross and it was full on, you know. Yeah. Um, wow. Um, so the 90s was um, great, the cops left everyone alone and um, everyone partied hard and then something went wrong and I don't know what went wrong. Something went wrong and all of a sudden events couldn't be run and you get a lot of pressure and then you are funnelled into back, well, we're getting funnelled back into the underground now Yeah. and we're trying not to go back underground. We're trying to say no, we're here, we, we're out, we want to so the only way they can do that now is to say, oh, you people go to all these venues or close all the venues down. And to me, it's just about money, developer money. Sorry, but that's what it's about. Not about, I think uh, collateral damage is us losing our lifestyle. Mm -hmm. 
that I think most of these pubs here will end up being, including here, will end up being high-rise apartments one day. And that's what the government wants. When you say the, that a lot of this is going underground, what do you mean by that? Um, well, if, if you're unable to hold events normally, then mm. you now have to hold events that, um, where you don't have a lockout law, or you may have to think about, like, depends what happens with this law, it may mean you might have to say, well, now we're just going to have a warehouse party, which they're all illegal as well, but you might have to make that decision that we still want to have a party, we're going to fight this. Um, because it's now been a good three years since we've been able to have a decent party. Wow. Um, there's a lot of people whose employment has been affected terribly by the situation. You know, um, DJs, um, sure. entertainers, both singers and drag, don't have the work they used to have. A lot of the venues have shut down. Yeah. Um, and so it's quite a sad situation. So I find that the people coming through now in the, you know, what are we, nearly 2020, have probably got less freedom and less of a lifestyle than we had in the mid 90s. Because I think that's when it was all happening. That's a very strong statement. I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, and, you know, a lot of it, even today, like things like when you're in, in a hotel, you can't have condoms available for people. It seems to be the case. So every time an event is held in what we call a straight pub, you've got to take your own condoms if you're running an event because people might need them for something or other when they're leaving. You know, it's not, it doesn't mean they're going to use them there, but you know, for when they're leaving for safety purposes, you know, and there's none available in those venues none available and things like that so you know they talk about oh we don't want AIDS to spread we don't want this we don't want that but where's your basic things like people will meet up and they will go home together wow. so look after the health side of it so we are blessed we have ACON which is um, they look after our health needs and so you know once a year I'll go up there and get a giant box full of condoms and party packs and that'll last us a year but I've got to take them to every event we go to because it's just seems to be something that has gone, been forgotten as well. That sort of thing. So it's illegal, apparently, to have them in the toilets and things now. Um, so we just slip them out of coat check when people are leaving. Here, take one of these, put that in your pocket, throw them in your bag. Um, and we haven't been told off yet, but yeah, just little things like that, I think, just make um, people's lifestyle choices a little different. Yeah. What, what I'm hearing, maybe, maybe I'm hearing between the lines here a little bit, is th there seems to be a bit of systematic uh, oppression and, and discrimination really boiling up here. Maybe it's, mm. or am I misunderstanding you? No, I don't think so. Okay. I think a lot of us are, 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 are very sentimental and missing the, the days that we, when we could yeah. go and do whatever, whatever we liked and no one, was, no one was harming anyone, there was never a problem. Um, and you know, I feel that people who are trying to run the events today are struggling to try and make them as meaningful as they were back 20 years ago because there are rules now, there's no sex on premises and if there's a sex on premises it's got to be all male, well that's what it seems to be, all male so then girls can't come to the event. Um, so there's all those problematic things of who do we discriminate against, so do, the, do we let the boys put on their own event at a men only space so that they can at least have an event but that means that all the women miss out and we fought so hard for the women to be equal. Or do we then say, okay, boys, you can come to the pub and it's just going to be like we are here, having a vent at a pub. There's no sex on premises, there's none of that, but then you can leave and go and do whatever you want afterwards. Yeah. Um, and so it causes those dilemmas as well, I find. Um, and I think it is discrimination. Yeah. 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 How we fight it, I don't know. Yeah. don't know. We haven't figured that one out yet. You've also said that you feel the traditional Tom of Finland look is unrealistic. Ah. What, what do you mean by that? Okay, so what do I mean? So, okay, the Tom of Finland look suits you. I think the Tom of, fin Tom of Finland look sort of suits me to some degree. But um, for what I would say for the average person out there now in the leather community, the Tom of Finland look is not the look that they all aspire to. They're not all lean, tall, skinny pieces of machine. There's all body sizes. Um, and I think in, like with women now, the, the beautiful um, corsets and um, latex um, 
options that are open to the women is absolutely, you know, to behold. Yeah. Um, so to me, that is just as fetish as having a man in a mule cap in his Tom of Finland um, outfit. But there are a lot of the old, what I call the old guard, who aren't see that as, that, that's the only leather, you yeah. should, that, that this is it. If you don't look like that, then you're not really a leather person. And that is not true today. And especially I would say with the under 40s, that they wear leather their way and often make a lot of their own outfits. And I think that that should be embraced. Yeah. So, and I'm, I'm very bad, I'm one of these people, I do not like body shaming. You know, people, oh, you're too fat for this or you're too skinny for that or whatever. And, you know, sometimes having, you know, men have a beer belly and they don't want to have him poking out in a leather shirt. They want to wear their own thing. They may want to wear a kilt. They may want to wear something else. And mm -hmm. I think all that's absolutely fine. Absolutely fine. Um, but I think the traditional, you know, if you're wearing your traditional dress-up leathers, it would be looking like that. And that doesn't suit everyone. Mm, true. In, in 2014, you won the AIDS I Council did. of New South Wales Award. Tell us about that. Oh, that was a complete honour and I, I still treat it as an honour. Um, that means uh, I was, someone nominated me, obviously some people I know, I never knew, I never found out who and I'm ever grateful for them. Um, for just for the years of work I've done volunteering for various organisations. Um, I don't just do the leather work, I also um, every year run an Anzac Day um, fundraiser and I've been doing that for about 14 or 15 years now as well. Um, and I did have done Rattle the Bucket for BGF and quite a few other people over the years and Mardi Gras. And um, yeah, I won the state award for volunteer, basically for all your volunteering, the volunteering services I've done over the years. So it was lovely to be acknowledged and it is a big honour. Yeah. Um, and I still treat it as a big honour. I just feel sad that I'm sort of at that time of my life now that I don't have the energy or the hours to input as much as I used to, but I still do as much as I can. That's wonderful. Still it's quite an honour. But yeah. it is a very big honour. Yeah. Very big honour. You know. What are your thoughts on mentoring in the community? Important. Were you mentored? Um, not officially mentored, but I would say um, I learnt a lot, I asked a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. So um, as far as Leather Pride, when I joined Leather Pride, I really didn't know a lot about Leather Pride. So people like, um, or oh, elders I would call them, people like Gary Kennedy and Katrina Harrison provided me a lot of in insight and background and advice. So there were elders that I was able to, you know, past presidents of Leather Pride that I was able to talk to to understand where to lead the organisation. Um, and there's a lot of history you need to know too sometimes when you take the top job that other people don't know, like how many pubs you're barred from and things like that. Oh, um, you know, oh. all those sort of things come out as well. But um, I would, yeah, I've been mentored in many of the roles I've done, but may, not, maybe not officially, um, but have definitely received some really good advice and mentorship from um, many people. But even as far as this year goes, before I went across to Wimsall BB, I had Chris Ross, who was an IML contestant from years ago, who sat me down and also gave me, you know, some advice on being a judge at one of those events. And because um, I was a bit overwhelmed, going, "Oh wow, little old me over there," um, and and he gave me some background as well. And so even currently, I still have him to accept advice and a bit of mentoring on things I don't know because I don't know everything. I know that. Yeah. Um, but I also like to pass on what we do know to um, younger, the younger generation where we can, because we're all getting a bit older now. So um, we like to pass on a bit of the history. Um, they're all, and you know, but I, I'm actually enjoying the difference now. I mean, I've never seen so many puppies in my entire life. You know what I mean? So I think the current leather scene, as far as visuals, is probably much better than it was 30 years ago because of the, the variety yeah. now. Yeah. You know, everyone's got their own little thing. You know, my girlfriend loves dressing up as a pussycat. I'm fabulous. <laughs> you know? So, um, everyone's got their own little piece of fetish and it doesn't, as, you know, going back to that Tom of Finland, it doesn't have to be that. And, and the young ones, you know, they can take on our advice, but they, nowadays it's just, they just do their thing. And I just yeah. think it's, it's delightful that they can just get out there and do their thing. Yeah. Well, you, you touched on uh, judging at IMSL BB yeah. and that you, you received a bit of advice 
for that. What differences do you see between your local community, your local yeah. title holding circuit here mm -hmm. versus what you encountered at IMSL BB? Mm, yeah, size. Um, here, a very small community, even, um, even if we go broader than leather and just say the total fetish community in all the states is still quite small. Everybody knows everybody or some, to some degree know, they know people in each state. Um, when you go to America, I mean, there was 52 states once, I don't know how many there are now, but they're about the same many as there are weeks in a year. Yet you're going to have every pub has a leather competition, every city has a leather competition, every state region has a competition, every yeah. state has a competition, and then the, the country has a competition. So the people in America have got a competition to go to every weekend. It's true. There's a rubber one on, there's a leather one on, there's something else. And um, so they, to them, some of them it's a lifestyle. They actually, that's, yes. I met the people that all they do is do this circuit in America of going around all these competitions. What a life, I'd love it. Um, so that was completely different to what I found to here, completely different. Yeah, yeah. And I'm still friends with a lot of those people on Facebook. So I see them every weekend going, last week was Iowa, this week somewhere else, you know. So there, there's so much more over there to be able to do where we're lucky if we put an event on every two years. Wow. You know, because wow. of effort and volunteers and time and cost and organising things. So, yeah. you know, we don't have the, um, I suppose the numbers like that, because they've got, you know, what is it, 300 million people over there or something. So there's a lot yeah. of people. So I think, yeah, so that there's so much more for them to attend to. It's uh, very more normal. So you can actually live your whole life there being a leather person, never not having to be a leather person, I yeah. think. Yeah. You, know, going, you know, going to events and stuff. Whereas here, um, I think, you know, when there is a, a fetish night or leather or fetish night, it's a special occasion. And we all treat it as a special occasion because they don't come up all the time. Yeah. Wow. Once, you know, once a year. Once a year we have Mardi Gras, <laughs> once a year we'll have a leather, leather competition. Once a month you'll get um, good events on like Hellfire and other ones, Extra Dirty is about once every four months. So we're talking about we don't have parties every Saturday, leather, leather events every Saturday night to um, go to. So yeah. I found that was a big difference over there that, you know, we just don't have the numbers. Um, but I also think that over there too, everyone wants to be a title holder. I don't know what it is, you know, like they've got this fascination with titles, <laughs> titles and pronouns. Yeah. Two things I really don't care about. <laughs> you know, like, what's your pronoun? Just call me Webby, will you? What's your pronoun? Shut up. Just call me Webby. You know, I don't like putting anyone in a box and I don't like to be put in a box. And I think as soon as you start labeling yourself, you put yourself in a box. Yeah. So I just yeah. like to be me, and I think we all like to think we're a little unique. So just call me by my name, please. Yeah, but like that's a, that's a difference I found, and I I found there's lots of little pockets too. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of insecure people mm. who sort of go to those things to find a little bit of um, you know more fringe people, but you know trying to find solace in something or a connection with something. Um, other people, and I found the men extremely supportive. That's one of the things that I did get over there with the, um, the women's competition was the audience, I would have thought, was 30% men. And a lot of them were title holders. And so they were very supportive. Um, and, you know, I got to talk to a lot of them and they were very supportive of me, which I was amazed at. Um, the men really support the women over there, which I thought was a, a lovely, lovely thing. But, yeah, yeah, numbers. It's just, yeah, they can live the lifestyle. Yeah. yeah. I think I mentioned to you Thursday, we've like got three leather shops in Australia or something, you know, to buy, okay, buy your shirts. So we all end up wearing the same shirts. Uh, we all end up wearing the same pants. It's yeah. very hard to have something unique unless someone's made it themselves. You know, when I was over in San Francisco, just walking up and down the Castro, I was like, I need 10 suitcases because there was so much there I could have bought. Yeah. But we don't have opportunity to <coughs> buy, yeah. if that made sense. So I think... There's just so much more opportunity over in the place like that. But I don't know that I'd like to keep attending large events. I quite like small events, you know, so um, I'd rather do, you know, 100 people or 400 people than do 4,000 people. Uh -huh. Very hard to work the room when you've got a big crowd, you know. Um, but um, that's, I think that's the difference over there. You could lead okay. the lifestyle if you wanted to full time, pretty much. What advice have you for women uh, and really anyone yeah. looking to enter the Leather Kink community? Um, don't be afraid. 
I think, okay. because I think the first few times, even myself, you know, the first few times you go out, you, you don't know what to expect, and some people can be a, maybe a little overbearing and maybe give you a bit of a, ooh, you know, a bit fright or something like that. Yeah. Um, people dress to look important, <coughs> um, doesn't mean they are. Um, no, seriously. Yeah. Um, and so I think what happens is once you get beneath what people look like, yeah, so don't judge a book by its colour. Once you get to know people, people generally have a good heart, mm. you know, and mm. some people might, you know, when some people are what I call him playing the Sir, for instance, that when they're playing the character of Sir out on the, out on the scene, they have a certain character, same as a mistress might do the same, they have a certain character and you respect that character. Yeah. But if I see them at the coffee shop on a Sunday afternoon or something like that, it's going to be, hey mate, how are you going? Do you know what yeah. I mean? So yeah. um, they've all got a good heart underneath. And I think, um, yes, join, see if it's your tribe, but don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to approach people, I think, yeah. is the big thing. And it's all about consent yeah. as well. Yeah. You know, no means no. Have, a, have your, you know, Pineapple, have your safe word, yeah. um, and 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 talk to people, talk to people. Think about what you're interested in, what you like, what you don't like, what you want to have a you know a look into, because people don't know unless you don't unless you say something. True. You don't know, and be willing to try things you've never tried. I think, <laughs> yeah, be willing. I mean, I never thought I'd end up on an A-frame. Ended up on an A-frame at Hellfire once. It was the best time of my life. <laughs> Couldn't feel me back for about a week and a half, but I had a good time. <laughs> so, you know, unless you have a go, you don't know. So, yeah, yeah don't be afraid. I think this is, is a big thing. People get a bit nervous. Um, don't be afraid and just be yourself. What's the biggest misconception about you? Oh, that I'm unapproachable, I think. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people are frightened by me. I like it like that. <laughs> if I don't know them, I like it like that. I'm happy with it like that. Um, a lot of the gay boys think I still run the lesbian mafia, but I don't anymore. Someone else has taken over, so that's okay. Um, um, yeah, I think. Yeah, you, you, I think what happens is you probably come across, or I, you know, myself and many people like me come across probably a bit harder than we um, are at home. Okay. You know. So, you know, if I'm out, I don't take shit and I'm fair dinkum. So don't bring it on because you'll lose is, is going to be my attitude. Okay. So um, for one thing, I, do not, I will not tolerate violence at any event I run or event I'm at. But, you know, if I'm just visiting, I don't have control. But if I have control, if I see any violence, any domestic violence, any verbal abuse, anyone not being treated with respect or anyone being bullied or anything like that, out the door, I don't care who you are. And I've trodden on a few toes doing that. But to me, yeah. my values are more important. Yeah. So I can come across as being very, quite harsh or a hard taskmaster, as some people say too. Um, but I think once people get to know me, yeah, I'm a different person underneath, as we all are. Well, Webby, I would like to thank you for thank you, an amazing interview here in the Fireside Chat series. And thank everyone for attending today. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you for you. listening to my story.